Welcome back, everyone, to the Commands of Christ podcast. We're so glad that you could join us here again, and we are thrilled to be joined in the studio today by Nathan Johnson. Nathan Johnson has a huge heart to encourage believers in going deeper in their walk with God and understanding His Word. He teaches at the discipleship program Ellerslie, and he also has um, his deeper Christian ministry where he puts out resources to help Christians engage with the Lord Jesus Christ through His Word. Nathan, it is a joy to have you here today. Thanks for having me. So what I want to focus on during our time together here is the, as, as you know, this podcast is centered around the commands of Christ, but really at the heart of it is that we want to encourage our listeners to cultivate intimacy in their relationship with the Lord. And I feel like a huge key for that is us making that transition from just knowing about God and knowing facts about him or knowing even truths about him to really knowing him personally and intimately, would you just share at the beginning here a little bit about how God brought you on that journey of coming to the place from just approaching the word for academic information about the Lord to instead approaching the word to really get to know the person of Christ? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I grew up in a Christian church, uh, just a little little home church kind of thing. And uh, it is amazing how as you're progressing through your, especially your early years of being a Christian, how oftentimes what you hear is probably not what they meant. Uh, But what I always heard growing up was, hey, you need to read your Bible. Uh, If you're going to be a good Christian, this is, this is your checklist of what you need to do. And it was all duty. It was all obligation. And so I I would read the word, but all I was trying to do is gain information. And it's so interesting. There was this radical turning point in my life, uh, which was back in 2005, where I traveled with this evangelist and he was saying, you do realize that if God truly is alive, If he truly does live inside of your life, then we should actually get to know him as a person, that we should be communicating with him. And one of his primary means of communicating with us is through his word. And so as we read the word, why are we just looking for the next little trivia or the next Bible nugget? Rather, we should be seeking to know him, that we should know his heart, know his mind, know his character. And in one sense, one of the best ways for me to know Jesus to, to get wrapped up in relationship with him is actually to know his word. And so there's just this interesting idea that, yeah, we can know a lot about God, but the demons know a lot about God. They have a lot of information. In fact, it says that they know and they tremble. And yet we know that they ain't making it, that, that there is a reality of life to the Christian that goes beyond just the academic or just goes beyond the information where their lives are actually have been transformed by the reality of truth. And they actually know their God, not just know about their God. And what, when you began to make, because that's a huge key transition, and I could yeah. echo it a lot in my life too, when God began to um, to really, when I really began to get into the Word, um, and I, I was kind of in, in a similar place where I was, um, I would get up before I had to go to work, and I'd be tired, and I'd, I'd read a chapter or two and close the book, and it felt more like something I did more as a duty as opposed to a relationship. Mm. But I remember when God began to transform my life was when I began to approach the Word with and began to saturate my life in it and began to approach the Word pursuing intimacy with Jesus. And when that happened, it was like as I began to get into the Word and I began to cultivate intimacy with the Lord, God began to reveal himself to me in the Word, and it changed my life. It was like as I delighted myself in the Lord through the Word, he became the desire of my heart. And that shift was just life-changing for me. What happened to you when you started to approach the Word this way? (laughs) I mean, literally everything in my life turned upside down. Uh, I started gaining victory in areas I didn't know was even possible. I, I had this insatiable desire for Jesus. Uh, my love for him just grew. And then I loved the word even more. And it was just like, it was like this fire that just began to grow, grow in me. And one illustration I love to give is, you know, you, you look at this, say this engaged couple. I've, I've learned, I just don't talk to engaged couples because I can't communicate. The, the guy is in such la la land. I've just, you know, like, hey, what time is it? Oh, it's it's almost time for marriage. You know, like, hey, you know, look at this guy. It's beautiful. Yes, yeah, she is. You know, he's in such a delusion in, a, in the best possible way uh, of his future spouse. Why? Because it's relational. It's it's intimate. It's there's this profundity. If, if I just said, hey, tell me about your wife, Gabe. And you're like, well, you know, here's here's all the facts and the details. It, it would actually feel strange because you may know a lot of good information about your wife. But the reality of your marriage is actually in the relationship itself. It's in the, the oneness and the unity and the intimacy. And the more you get to know her over the years, it's not that you don't know the information. The information comes, but the richness of the relationship comes through the time and the intimacy. 
And that is an amazing picture of what we could have with Jesus, that it's more than just, you know, can you say the creeds and do you know the information and, and can you, you know, do you have that, all those details, but really do I have relationship with the King of the universe? And when, when, when God began to do that in my life, everything changed. And it's like a whole new frontier of relationship with Jesus finally became possible. Uh, and these last couple of decades, I, w- I would not trade it for anything because he is so good. Hallelujah. And you know, it was, I found the same way for me. It just revolutionized my walk with God. When I started to go to the Word to meet with Jesus and began to experience that fellowship and that intimacy and that communion with him, it, 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 was, it was so transformational. And I feel like one of the reasons was, was because... You know, in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later on in that chapter, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so as we get into the written Word, we're actually fellowshipping with the living Word, Jesus Christ. Someone said it this way, Fall in love with the Word of God, and you will fall in love with the God of the Word. And that was my experience. It was like as I began to really go to the Word to cultivate intimacy with Jesus, I found a greater love for the Word forming in my life because as I was spending time in the Word, I was growing in my walk with Him. But I think it's important for us to see that as we start to understand this concept that actually when Scripture talks about knowing God— that word no in the Greek is actually very profound because in English, no we can be used a lot of different ways, you know, just like you could just like we could say love and use it in a lot of different ways, right? Like, right? Like we love right. God, but we but, but then we can we use love in a lot of different ways. And that just to see that in the same way this word no in English, we just hear the word no, but actually as you dig into the Greek, there's actually a profound meaning behind it that helps us to understand what God's after. Can you unpack that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. So there's a few different words that are translated know or knowledge. Uh, One is this idea of like facts and data and information. It's it's nostos. It's where we get the word gnosticism from. It's like heady stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's it's the academic information. And praise the Lord, we have academic information. And when we study the word, there is an element of academics. But there should be something beyond that, just the information. It's the two plus two equals four kind of knowledge stuff. It's like, you know, you read the newspaper headline. It's that kind of knowledge. Uh, There's another type of knowledge in scripture. uh, It's the Greek word oida uh, that actually is the word that's also used for sight on some occasions. So it says, you know, that Jesus saw their hearts or some translations will say that he knew their hearts. Somehow it's like this perception and and insight and this this aha kind of an idea. It's like the light bulbs turned on and and I'm I'm getting a revelation and, and praise the Lord, that comes through the word too. But hands down, my probably my favorite Greek word of all time uh, is a word called gnosko. And it's also translated know or knowledge, but it's very different than the other two. It's, it's not facts, data, information. It's not just perception and understanding. The way it's primarily used is about intimacy and experiential kind of knowledge. Uh, it's the kind of knowledge where uh, in you know the story, Gabriel comes to Mary and says, hey, congratulations, you're going to be with the Christ child. And Mary says, well, what, do you, what do you mean? Because I don't know, I've never known a man. And obviously what she doesn't mean is, well, what's a man? Could you point one out to him? I mean, like, I've never seen one before. That, that's obviously not true. The, what she's saying is there's never been that intimacy. It's never been that marital connection. And so it's used in that sense. But I love how, as you start looking at this idea of gnosko, it, it goes beyond just, oh, I read it. Oh, I just heard about this. Oh, I just, and becomes this, I've experienced it, or I have Man, this thing has changed my life. For example, if I look and say, Gabe, uh, when you got married, did you know your wife? And hopefully you would say yes, because in our culture, that's a little weird. If you're like, no, I've never met her before, right? And you had information, but yet you also knew because you spent time with her, you know, you know what excited her. You know what just was the passions of her heart and the dreams. And how long have you been married now? We've been married for about six years. Okay. So after six years of marriage, wouldn't you say that you actually know your wife better now than when you married her. And that seems weird because you're like, well, well then shouldn't we know all the details about our spouse before we marry them? And yet there's that relational reality of knowing that 
as you spend more and more time with someone, right. you, you start to grow and you start to deepen and mm -hmm. it just it gets better and better and better as time goes on. I love that picture because it's that way in our relationship with the Lord too. Yes. You know, in, in, in that God wants to take us past just the facts and information, although that's oftentimes where we start. We, we learn some of the facts and the details and the information as we get into the Word, but God wants to take us past the, just that. He wants to take us past just the noskos knowing, right, where it's just the, um, the, the, the informational knowing to the gnoskos, right, where it's that personal, intimate, experiential knowing. And that only comes way and way. That comes through spending time with Jesus. Right. Just like the more time I spend with my wife, the more I get to know her, the more I get to know her personally. And it's the same way with the Lord. The more, there's no shortcut to it. Someone said love is spelled T-I-M-E. But it's so true. The more time we spend with the Lord, the more we get to know him. And I think sometimes in even our Christian culture, there can be a real focus on having right doctrine, right? And right theology. And we should, right? Doctrine's important. Theology's important. It's not lessening that. But if all we have is doctrine and theology and facts, but we don't have that intimate experiential knowing of the Lord, then we're falling so short of what God has for us as believers of the fullness of relationship with him. And in a scary sense, we almost have to test whether we're even saved. And, mm -hmm. and that that's almost an extreme statement. Mm -hmm. But when you look at like Satan, and this is mm -hmm. a horrible comparison perhaps, but Satan actually knows a lot of theology. Mm -hmm. uh, Satan actually has a lot of scripture memorized. Mm -hmm. And yet he's not saved. Mm. And when you look at this idea of someone who has all the right facts and data and information and knowledge, but doesn't have relationship, mm. Jesus actually makes it very clear that mm. uh, that's actually not salvation. Mm. And John 17, three is just an incredible passage when Jesus is praying to the father and he's makes this statement. And, and it seems almost for our sake, it almost seems like this little weird statement. He's praying to the father and he says, Oh, that they might know eternal life. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about what eternal life is. And for a lot of us, we're like, oh yes, eternal life's amazing. And yes, eternal life's great. And eternal life for most of us in our modern day has become a true and false test. It becomes, do I have the correct doctrine? Mm -hmm. And yet Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they might know that gnosko, you, the one true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So when you look at this idea of even what is salvation, salvation is not having the correct doctrine. Mm -hmm salvation and it is all about getting wrapped up in intimacy and relationship with Jesus. And if I have relationship with him, whoo, I mean, if I don't have that, I may have the correct doctrine, but that doesn't actually mean I'm even saved. Mm -hmm. And so the reality of knowing Christ is so foundational to everything we believe. Mm -hmm. And yes, we should grow in our knowledge. Yes, we should grow and understand the word doctrinally, but the intimacy of Christ is, is the driving force of everything. The reason I, I should know the word doctrinally is so I can actually know him more, uh, right? The, the reason you want to spend time knowing the, the childhood of your wife and the details of her awkward moments. And the reason you want to do that is because you, you actually want better relationship. Mm -hmm. And that really needs to be the same thing with Jesus, that I want to know mm -hmm. the truth because I want to know him even more. Yeah, that salvation is about entering into a relationship through Jesus Christ yes. with God, right? It's not just about fire insurance. It's not just, oh, I got my fire insurance, you know, I'm not going to go to hell, so I'm good. You know, it's like, it's not about just getting the fire insurance. It's about really, and obviously praise God that he saves us from hell, right? That's a wonderful, glorious reality, Amen. but he wants to bring us into a real living relationship with himself. And I, I think of even the, that sobering passage in Matthew 7, where Jesus talks about all these, these different wonderful things. I mean, incredible things you hear that, that was happening, you know, that we would say, wow, that's like outstanding. I mean, prophesying you know, casting out demons and all these different things that's happening. Like, wow, that's incredible. But then Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And there's that word, no, the gnosko. Um, I never knew you. And just seeing that God wants intimate relationship with us. I, I was speaking, um, I, was, I was sharing for a wedding earlier this year, and they asked me to share the gospel. And one of the ways that I felt like the Lord led to explain this concept in, in one way was when we're talking about the gospel and, 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 and that salvation is about more than just fire insurance. It's about entering into an intimate relationship with God was the idea of, I said, when this couple was getting married, I said it wasn't the reason that um, the, the, the bride was marrying the groom was not because she, just because she wanted to escape a life of singleness. It was because she wanted to enter into a loving relationship with her groom. And so it wasn't just about, I mean, if you, why are you getting married? To escape singleness. I mean, like, yes, she was going to escape. I mean, she was not going to be single anymore, but it wasn't to escape singleness. It was to enter into a loving relationship with her groom and just to see that God's calling us to this loving relationship with him, not just to escape judgment, although praise God, there is the deliverance that he brings, but it's to bring us into that intimate knowing with himself. Mm, amen. 
I think is just is so powerful and so transformational. As we look at this, so how does this, when we start to re- make this transition from realizing that God wants us to know him intimately and personally, that, that when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we pass from death to life, we're born again of the Spirit of God, we're saved, but now to grow that relationship, to grow that gnosko, to grow deeper in that intimacy with the Lord, it's kind of like the salvation is the, is the couple saying I do to each other. They entered into a relationship, but now they're, 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 they're living together um, for the rest of their lives. How does this gnosko play out in our daily life? I think it's foundational for every moment of our day. It, it is It is interesting to me. Uh, I think it was A.W. Tozer who said, those who desire, those who want to know God must spend time with him. That it, it, And it's not, again, it's, it cannot be a checklist thing. It has to somehow, yeah, you may not feel like it every day, but you you need it. We somehow need to press forward into this. I want to spend time with Jesus. Mm. And if Jesus is just merely fire insurance, mm. then, oh, well, then it just becomes a, okay, thank you all. I'll, I'll give my hat and nod to you. Mm. But if it's an actual relationship, relationship demands time. Relationship demands intentionality. And again, I think getting into the word is so primary for this, but I need to be seeking his face. I need to be spending time in prayer. I need to be spending time with the body of believers because that's actually one of the ways that we grow and mature as believers. Mm-hmm. And yet again, I think in my own soul, I have to keep checking myself to say, why, what's the motive behind all this? You know, why am I praying? Why am I spending time in the word? Why, why am I going to church? And if it's for any other reason other than, Lord, I actually want to know you. I want to, I, I desperately need to increase my intimacy with you. Somehow could I experience you on a whole nother level? Well, then I need to somehow let God transform my heart. You know, it's, I'm presuming there's probably days where you're like, oh, all right, I got to go spend time with my wife. But it is amazing. And I've noticed it so many times, even on those kind of days where if you would just press into the word, if you would press into prayer, and you actually meet with the Lord, you thoroughly enjoy it. It, there, there, it somehow transforms your heart and your mind, and it just it radically changes everything. It, it starts changing your, the way you think, the way you talk, your, your, your motives, what you desire. It, it filters down and begins to change every arena uh, of our lives. And for me, that is incredibly exciting. Um, I've often given the illustration of a cute old couple, uh, which is... I cannot wait to become a cute old couple. I have to become old and, and get married, but uh, I'm waiting for this moment where I can be a cute old couple. Uh, but I, I love looking at cute old couples because when, when you look at a cute old couple, uh, it, it's amazing to me how they have their own language. Like they have spent so much time together. It's just like, they don't even have to talk anymore. He, she looks at him and he looks back at her and a whole conversation has taken place. And you're like, what, what just happened? But what's neat about cute old couples is they don't just have the same language. They they start to act like each other. They start to talk like each other. They start to look like each other. And wouldn't it be amazing if we had that with Jesus, that I would just spend so much time with him and I'd build my life around him. And this isn't, you know, did you get your chapter today keeps the devil away and then you go about your life. This is what would it look like to actually have a relationship. And if the God of the universe actually lives inside of our life through the Holy Spirit, well, then I can talk with him all throughout the day. I, I can spend time with him all throughout the day. I can, I can meditate upon the word and just be delighting myself in Jesus all throughout the day. And as such, I am growing and maturing, being conformed to Christ. And my passionate, my passionate heart and desire is that I would get to know Jesus so intimately, so well, that just like a cute old couple just can't help themselves. Wouldn't it be neat if I just spent so so much time with Jesus that I just started to talk like Jesus and act like Jesus and think like Jesus. In fact, I started to look like Jesus where somehow I fade into the background and the world even though they see me, they don't see me, they, they somehow see Jesus. I want, I just want that so bad. And that's what it's about, right? That's our heart cry as believers. That's what we desire. It reminds me in Philippians where he says, that I may know him, right? I believe it's that same word, gnosko, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, because as we know him intimately and personally, he begins to be seen in and through our life. One of my one of my favorite verses on this is where this idea of as we spend time with the Lord, we are we are conformed His image. Just like as a, as a couple spends time together, they start to take on each other's manners. I've even seen this with my wife and I, where there was just something that happened, and I said something, and, and it was a phrase that just it was a something my wife always says, and I said it, and it she was like, and, and we both kind of laughed because we know it was something she always says, and I'm starting to say the thing she says, and sometimes she'll say something like, yeah, that was me, you know, because we're becoming like each other, <laughs> and we start to talk like each other, we pick up certain mannerisms like each other as we spend time together, not because we're even trying to, but just just because as you spend time with each other, you start to rub off on each other. Um, and But I think it's so similar in our relationship with God in this sense. It talks about it in Corinthians. It says, but we all, with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, 
are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. And so it's like Scripture tells us here how we're changed. It says we're changed by beholding Him. That as we spend time in His Word, as we spend time in prayer, as we spend time seeking His face and beholding Him, we become what we behold. What we look at is ultimately what we become. Um, Tozer said, what you think about when you're free to think about whatever you will, that is what you are or will soon become. And so as we spend time with God and we behold him, we begin to be conformed to the image of his son, not by the power of our flesh, but actually it says through the work of the spirit. And it says we are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. That as we behold his face, as we spend time with him, we are changed into his likeness. Now the world doesn't see Nathan Johnson. They don't see Gabe Kleeter. They see Jesus. And I know that's our heart cry. That's the heart cry of every person listening that's a believer is I want people to look at my life them to see Jesus. Amen. As we kind of start to wrap up here, I want you to just touch on what does it look like for the world to begin to see Jesus in and through our life? Like, cause, because the world's watching and they see when the pressures come, they see when the trials come. How does, as we walk in this gnosko, and we've already touched on it, but as we walk in this intimate knowing of Christ, does that start to exude out of our life in every arena? Oh, it's so good. Uh, Paul says in Corinthians that our life is a diffuser of the fragrance of God. Hmm. And uh, several years ago, my aunt got into the whole oil thing. And so she gave me a little diffuser and I put the water in, I put a few drops of the oil in, and I turn it on. It's amazing. I love a diffuser. It spits at you. It just, pss, pss, pss. and in just a matter of moments, the entire room is filled with whatever that fragrance is. And Paul says, do you realize that we who carry Christ, his spirit within us are actually diffusing his fragrance to the world, that that which is inside of us is to bubble forth outside of us. Uh, if you would want a different illustration, if you squeeze a tube of toothpaste, what comes out of it? Well, toothpaste. Why? Because that's what was in the tube. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be amazing if, if we are to diffuse the fragrance of Christ? And I, well, I understand it's a stench to the world and it is a fragrance to the believers. But what would it look like if I was so filled with him and so full of his presence that when the pressures of my life come, when the squeezing of the tube in my life happens, and it's not if it's going to happen, it's when is it going to happen? All of us will be squeezed. So when we're cut off in traffic or when we have that phone call or when we have that, whatever that may be in your life, wouldn't it be neat if that which comes out is actually not you, it was Jesus. Wouldn't it be neat if the diffusing reality of your life that just spits out upon everything in the world was Jesus? I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if you're walking down the, the grocery aisle and, and you bump into someone, what comes out, comes out of you is Jesus. I mean, wouldn't it just be great as you're in the checkout line as you're talking to the person for 30 seconds, what comes out of you is Jesus. Well, I can grip my teeth and try to force that, or I can get wrapped up in intimacy with him. And it just seems to, the more you get to know him, the more you don't have to try, you don't have to struggle, you don't have to grit your teeth. And, oh, I gotta, I gotta bubble forth Jesus. Oh, I gotta, I gotta have the mind of Christ, WWJD. I, I actually don't even have to worry about that stuff. I can actually, as I'm pressing into him, his life is so changing me that just as you're taking on the words of your wife, I just start taking on his life Amen. and it begins to infect and affect every arena. So it's not just, well, this is a Sunday morning churchy thing. This is actually the life of Christ should radically change. Yes, the church, but your work and your family and your marriages and mm -hmm. how we relate to the people and, and just it's how, how you spend your free time and mm -hmm. what you do privately when no one's watching that the reality of Christ, when you begin to know and gnosko him, it, it, it should change everything just like marriage should change every arena of your life. It doesn't just change, you know, how good kissing is, or it doesn't just change whether or not you can have uh, children. It doesn't just change. It changes your schedule. It changes your free time, it, it, but as it should. And I think the same thing about knowing Jesus, if, if it's not radically changing every arena of our life, then I wonder if we don't actually know him well enough. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it, what is it, what is so powerful is that as God forms more and more of the life of his son Jesus as we grow in this relationship Jesus starts to come out like you said in every interaction it reminds me of what Jesus said in John 15 where he said I am the vine you are the branches he that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing and this really is we abide in him as we spend time cultivating intimacy with him he begins to live in and through our lives it reminds me of what somebody said once they said the christian life is not just an imitation of christ it's a participation in christ in other words that as we seek him and as we spend time with him he starts to come out of our life and when people look at us they don't see us and they see jesus mm -hmm. and the beautiful thing about this is that when that happens 
he gets the glory. Amen. And that's a wonderful thing. Nathan, as we close out here, is there any final word that you'd like to leave our listener? Maybe, maybe there's some listeners, some people listening, and they're young in their walk with God. They're excited. They want to go deeper. They want to grow in their not, um, knowing the Lord intimately through his word. What would you what would you encourage them with um, as kind of a final word of exhortation in, in propelling them forward them and cheering them on down this path of the narrow way? Yeah, absolutely. What I would say is just take one step. Come, come before the Lord and just say, Lord, I, I, I don't even have it, but I want it. And it's amazing when he begins to woo your heart. Uh, it is, it is amazing. It's you don't have to, you don't have to grit your teeth very long because as you start feeling the wooing of of him, you you strangely want to do it. And so if, if I was to encourage someone, I'm like, well, have this posture of desperation. Uh, start getting into the word. And as as you come to the word, don't just be like, all right, I'm going to read the word. What if you came to the word and said, Jesus, I want to know you. Uh, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you would you showcase your heart and your mind? And if we begin to read the word that way, and it's to know the author, if, if we come with this desperate desire to actually know him, the promise in Hebrews eleven six is if we would diligently seek him, he rewards those who do. And the amazing thing about the passage is the reward of those who diligently seek the Lord is that they get what they seek. They get him. Amen. And it's a beautiful reality that if you would just go after him, just take one step, he, he will satisfy. He will reward that. Amen. That's right. So just to encourage you as our listeners and, and for, for us too, uh, that we would be sold out in our relationship with God, that we would cry with um, uh, Paul, that, that I may know him, that, that, that we would take that next step in pursuing the Lord and seeking his face and growing in our relationship with him. You know, as I was, um, as I was, uh, had heard um, a, a recording of where you had shared some of these truths on the um, on the difference between um, Noskos um, just being information or facts. I'm not trying to pronounce that Greek word exactly right, but the Noskos just being information and facts, and the Gnoskos being the personal experiential knowing. I I felt like the Lord highlighted something to me that was that was really impactful, and that was in Ephesians, um, where um, Paul says, um, "And to know the love of Christ." which passes knowledge. And you're like, okay, how could I know something that passes knowledge? But what it says here, if you look at the Greek words, it says, and to know, gnoskos, it personally, experientially know the love of Christ that passes gnoskos, right? So God wants to bring us past just gnoskos knowing and bring us to gnosko knowing, where it's, it's something that passes. In other words, it's like God wants you to know it in such a way that's not just intellectual information. It's like experientially knowing the love that God has for me. It says in First John, we have known and believed the love he has for us. And then when that happens, when you begin to know it, know it not just up here, because we all know Jesus loves me, right? <laughs> but when we start to know it down here, you're like, Jesus loves me. Mm. And that affects every area of my life. Amen. I hope this episode has been encouraging, meant to you. May all of us intimately and personally know the love of God that passes knowledge and be transformed by that love into the image of Christ. God bless you, and we look forward to having you join us next week.